As many of you know my background, I mean, I grew up in Chicago in a working class community. My parents weren't wealthy, so we didn't have the resources to spend on fees at private schools. We went to the neighborhood public school, and I went to public school my entire life. And I, I was always that student who wanted to get A's. I wanted to do well. I enjoyed learning. I enjoyed excelling. But what I found out is that when you're one of those kids in a community where not everyone has the same goals, I found myself having to walk a bunch of different lines. There were some kids that didn't like kids who were smart and got good grades. There were some kids who criticized the way I talked. They said that I talked like I was white, which was another way of saying that you think you're better than other people. So I had to contend with, how do I get my education when I'm surrounded by people who may have different expectations of me? And those just weren't the kids in the neighborhood. There were teachers I had to confront, teachers who underestimated me every step of the way. Even when I applied to Princeton, I write about in my book and I tell this story all the time, even though I was at the top of my class and I was a class officer, I was a leader, when I sat down with my high school counselor, somebody who didn't know me but was assigned to work with students to help them apply to college, and I told them my intention was to apply to Princeton, that counselor told me, I don't think you're Princeton material. The person whose job it was to help young people reach their dreams when it came to college saw me, and whatever she saw in me told her that my dreams were too high. And that cut me in a way that even though I continued on, I applied, obviously you know I got in, but I still remember that story. I remember that feeling of doubt, just another adult sort of placing a barrier on me that I didn't even have for myself. So then to enter into an elite school when your high school counselor has told you you're not good enough, when all of society sort of looks at kids of color or kids from poor communities or rural communities as not belonging. You know, I, like many others, walked into that school with a stigma in my own head. More young people nowadays call it imposter uh, syndrome. I don't know if they call it that in, in Britain where kids like me feel like they don't belong, so they feel like they're faking it. And I had to get over that. And one of the ways that I got over it was that I looked around at Princeton and I saw kids who were not as talented or as gifted or as hardworking as I was. I learned that this notion of affirmative action sometimes only applies to kids of color or kids from different backgrounds or poor kid, but there are all kinds of affirmative action that take place in elite schools around the country athletes who are admitted because, not because they're great students, but because they can add value. Legacies, people who come from families with long lines within the school, they get admission. So I started to realize that the doubts that I had in my head were all mine. And I had to work to overcome that question that I always ask myself, am I good enough? And I write about that. That's a question that has dogged me for a good part of my life. Am I good enough to have all of this? Am I good enough to be the first lady of the United States? And I think that many women and definitely many young girls of all backgrounds walk around with that question. But how I overcame that is how I overcome anything. Hard work. So whenever I doubted myself, I, I just told myself, let me put my head down and do the work. And I would let my work speak for itself. And I still find that I do that. I still feel that at some level, I have something to prove because of the color of my skin, because of the shape of my body, because of who knows how people are judging. But it takes some time and it takes some maturity to start having some successes under your belt where you realize, yes, in fact, I am good enough. I absolutely believe that education is the key, not just for young women, but for people in general. Knowledge 
the opportunity to mature, to try new things, to meet new people, to be open to different cultures. You know, a lot of the problems that we have in the world come from a lack of knowledge. You know, people who are just underexposed to all the different ways there are to be human. Uh, and we judge people based on our limited understanding of the world. And I always try to hold out empathy for those who are in that position because I know that it's based in a place of ignorance sounds like a harsh word, but it's the appropriate word. Just not knowing. You only know what you know. And sadly, if your worldview is this small, and you know no one else that looks or think differently from you because you didn't have the chance to be educated or to travel or to see the world or to have your ideas challenged and to learn how to be analytical, you know, then it's understandable that you would be afraid of something different from you. But the only way we break through that is to educate ourselves and to educate the next generation you know, to open them up to new ideas. If you're not a strong reader, if you can't take in huge amounts of information and break it down and have it make sense, you won't even know when things are good for you or bad for you. So yes, I absolutely believe, and particularly for, for women and girls, because women still raise the next generation. Women are at the heart of all society. We bring life, we raise life, we nurture life, we feed our families. And if we don't know what to do, if those mothers raising children don't know how to keep them alive or not expose them to diseases or to feed them when they're hungry, if they can't raise a living to bring resources in, we all struggle. So it would seem to me that if we want to solve anything, any major issue that you can think about, climate change, terrorism, poverty, inequality, it starts with an education. I don't know how we, we do any of it if people don't know what they don't know. One of the challenges that formal education places before young people is that you're taught to figure out what you want to be when you grow up, right? And you're given titles, and there's a finite set of them. A lawyer, teacher, a researcher, you learn those titles. And then you, you do the work to get to those titles. And then you get jobs, and you have careers. What I learned was none of that has anything to do necessarily with who I am not what I want to be. What do I care about? How do I want to wake up and invest my time every day? What brings me joy? What makes me sad? We don't teach that in school, but I learned to try to find that for me and turn that passion into my career. And that was some of the best advice because that's when I decided, learned that I didn't want to be a lawyer because I'd never taken the time to think about why was I going to law school. I was going to law school because I thought I should be a lawyer, not because that's who I was. It wasn't that work filled me up. So I had to learn how to do that, and that required networking and exposing myself to more people and more jobs and more careers and more opportunities. As a result of that, I became uh, an assistant to the mayor in the city of Chicago. And then I went on to run a nonprofit organization and I went on to be an associate dean at a university and I went on to be the vice president at an academic medical center. And my life just started opening up in ways that I never predicted because I started asking myself that one simple question, not what did I wanna be, but who did I wanna be? And how did I want to show up in the world? And if you all can get the jump on starting to ask yourself that question as you, you know, go after your careers, if you're starting to think about what, what kind of work will bring you joy, 
because if you find that, you're going to do well at it and everything else is going to fall into place. And it did for me. I think young people, when they think about change, you get hung up on thinking that the only change that matters is something big and huge and powerful and mighty, starting your own organization or moving the needle on it on an initiative. But when you're young, the best thing you can do is, number one, take care of you because you are the best asset you can invest in at this time. So that means taking care of your space, your health, your education, protecting your heart is an important investment for the bigger picture. And then think about who's just, who's around you? Who can you really influence? And everyone can influence someone. Maybe it's a younger sibling. You know, maybe it's a neighbor. Uh, maybe it's another girl in a class below you. Because when you think about it, younger kids, they don't necessarily look up to the teacher. They look up to the girl right just above them. So I would urge you to think about who do you have access to right now, today, that is looking to you for guidance. They see you as a role model. Because I guarantee you there is someone in your life right now who thinks that the sun rises and sets on every word you say. And I would start talking to them. And I would do small things like bring them with me when I did something unique taking them to a museum. It's those small gestures that matter. It's not the grand sweeping actions that make change. Change happens every single day with the little interactions that you have with the people in your life. Well, I mentor because I was mentored. Yeah, I think Marion Wright Edelman, one of my heroines said, service is the rent we pay for living. And I feel the same thing. I feel like when someone invests in me, as many people have, I didn't get here on my own. I didn't get here because I was some miracle kid that had dust sprinkled on me and things just happened. There were people in my life who saw potential in me, people who didn't have to make the investment, who held a hand out and showed me the way. And some of them were much older than me. Some of them were people who were my peers or people just ahead of me. So I am a product of the generosity of other people's mentorship. So the expectation of myself is that I give that back. And it's also selfish of me that I mentor because I get a lot out of it too. I mean, one of the best things I do is spend time with younger people because they keep me focused. They, as I said at the top of this conversation, you all keep me clear and focused. I feel fulfilled in helping you achieve your goals. It's the most fulfilling thing that I do is to watch another person benefit from something that I help them do. I'm not here to compete with people. I'm here to, keep, to continue to lift people up. My hope is that the support that I've shown you and others have shown you, you will find it in you to show that to someone else. One of the reasons I started the mentorship program in the White House was because I wanted people to know that everyone has the time and the capability, even the First Lady and the President of the United States, because the President had a separate mentorship program too. And we connected our mentees with senior people throughout the White House, from the chief of staff to the head of the household to Secret Service agents. They were connected with people on a regular basis. So if, if we can do it, if we can find the, if we could find the time in our busy lives to take a moment out, because it, it doesn't even take that long, you can have an impact on another person with one good conversation. You know, I never underestimate the value of showing children my regard, which is why I take time out when I see kids. Because I think even if I'm with you in a photo line or on a rope line, that maybe there's one thing I can say to you, that you're beautiful, that you're smart, that I see you, 
you know, that I believe in you. Yeah, I don't know you, but sometimes a kid just needs to hear that. And that doesn't have to come from the First Lady. It's powerful when it does come from the First Lady. But coming from you, coming from all of you to someone who looks up to you, it means the same thing. So my expectation for all of you is that you find a way to mentor. And maybe now is not the time, but at some point in your life, when you get to a place where you have the space, my hope is that you make that time and that you continue to look for the mentors in your life because I still look for mentors, even today. Anybody who knows more than me, I'm gonna sit them down and they're gonna become my friend and I'm gonna ask for help. I did it when I came into the White House. One of the, the first people I sat down with were other living first ladies. I made it a point to meet with every single one of them. Number one, to just thank them for their service. Number two, I wanted to make sure they felt the lines of communication were open with me. Third, I wanted to know what it was like for them. What were their challenges? So you never stop learning, and I never stop learning. So if I'm still looking for mentorship, you all should be doing that at every phase of your life. Whether it's another mother, when you become a parent, you're gonna need other parents to help you mentor. If you're in a relationship, you're gonna want mentorship to help you get through your relationship. It never stops. I did a little experiment with a homeless person, not like on them, it's not like electrodes. <laughs> with them, voluntarily helped me. Because the whole idea of giving, right? You've all walked down the street and you've all seen someone begging and you either have or haven't thrown a few pennies in their cup. When you do, you feel good. You bought that feeling. That is a legitimate commercial transaction. You know, commercial transactions are defined as the exchange of consideration. There was an exchange of consideration here. You gave money, you got the feeling of goodwill. You paid for that feeling. If you didn't give money, you either feel nothing or you feel bad. You can't feel good by not giving. All right, you paid for that feeling. So now the question is, how is that person encouraging us to give? The joke is, they act like every corporation in the world. They talk about themselves. Me, 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 right? Like they sit there with their little outdoor advertising, little sign, right? And it says, I'm homeless, I'm hungry, I got 12 kids, I'm a veteran, God bless. They got it all in there, trying to appeal to somebody, the religious vote, the veteran vote, you know, the child sympathizer, surround yourself with lots of pets, go for that one too. All in an attempt to get something from someone. Takers, not givers, right? All about me. Well, what do, what do corporations do? We've added more RAM, we've added more ROM, we've added more speed. This one's number one. We're the biggest, we're the best. We've been around since 1969. We're better than them, we're faster than them. We're more efficient than that one. Me, 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 me. And so even if we buy their product, guess what? Yeah, we don't really feel much. So I did this little experiment. I found um, um, a nice homeless lady on the uh, streets of New York who's willing to help out. And I learned that with her sign, which was pretty typical, I'm homeless, I'm hungry, blah, blah, blah. She makes between 20 and $30 a day for, you know, for a day's worth of work, eight to 10 hours of sitting there selling goodwill. Eight to 10 hours, she'll make 20 to $30. $30 is considered a good day. I changed her sign and the new sign made her $40 in two hours, and then she left. It's one of the reasons she's homeless is because she's decided that she only needs 20 to $30 a day to live. If she stayed, she would have made $150. The point is she made 40 bucks in two hours. What did the sign say? The sign said, if you only give once a month, please think of me next time. It has nothing to do with the taker. It has everything to do with the giver. And what are the objections people give when they don't give? I can't give to everyone. How do I know that they really need it? And so I address both those concerns. I know you can't give to everyone. So if you only give once a month, my cause is legitimate. I will still be here when you're ready to give. 40 bucks, two hours. Make it about them, not about you. The fact of the matter is 100% of customers are people. And 100% of clients are people. And 100% of employees 
are people. I don't care how good your product is. I don't care how good your marketing is. I don't care how good your design is. If you don't understand people, you don't understand business. We are social animals. We are human beings. And our survival depends on our ability to form trusting relationships. Do you ever watch um, uh, Deadliest Catch on the Discovery Channel? I was flipping through the channels one night and Deadliest Catch came on. And on this episode, just random, they were in a huge storm. Now, for those of you who don't know Deadliest Catch, they take these crab fishing boats out in the Bering Sea, which is like terrible. And they put cameras on them and we watch, right? The reason that's, I guess, significant is because these crab fishermen have, I think, one of the top five deadliest jobs in the world. You know, I don't know what the exact number is, but dozens of fishermen die every year doing this. So they have cameras only on five or six of the ships, even though there are many, many, many ships that go out fishing every season. And they don't really come into proximity with each other because, you know, the, the ocean's huge. And they usually sabotage each other and give each other false information because they're all competitors. They're all looking to get the crabs and, you know, make sure that they find them and somebody else doesn't. And, you know, it's business, right? It's just business. It's okay. We all do the same thing in our own companies. And in this one episode, this big, huge storm was so violent that they had to bring all the pots, which are the big cages that they catch the crabs in. They had to bring all the pots back on the boat uh, and wait out the storm. And just by dumb luck, one of the boats that had cameras on it was in proximity of a boat that didn't have cameras on it. And so they filmed, they had secured all their pots on the deck, and so they started filming the other boat. And they filmed a guy climbing on the outside of the cage, securing the pots. And all of a sudden, a huge wave hits the side of the boat, and the guy is not there anymore. And the people on the boat with the cameras start screaming, man overboard, man overboard, man overboard. And they turn their boat towards where they think he might be. He's a stranger. They don't know him. They don't know the, the crew members of the other boat. And yet they react, and they turn towards him. And they find him in the drink, and... For those of you who don't understand how dangerous this is, if the water is so cold that if you're in the water for, I think that it's a minute or a minute 30, hypothermia will set in and you die. And they come upon him and he's screaming, don't let me die, don't let me die. And they pull him on board, not out of the woods yet. They strip off his clothes because it's wet and cold and they wrap blankets around him to prevent hypothermia from setting in. And he survives and it's overwhelming. And the captain comes down, and this is all on, I mean, you can go watch it on TV. You, the camera comes, the captain comes down, and he hugs this stranger, this young man, his competitor. He hugs this guy as if he's his own son. I lost it. Everybody is crying. And you realize what happened here was a human interaction. And the reason they risk their own lives to help this other person, even though they spend every other day trying to get ahead and sabotage, is because at the end of the day, they're all crab fishermen. And they know something about each other. And they know something about the risk that they all take to do this. And when push comes to shove, they will put themselves out there to help each other for no other reason than they get it. They're one of the same. I will promise you, that every single member of that crew that day went home with a feeling of fulfillment. I promise you that every single person on that crew that day felt more good in their hearts and in their jobs than the richest days that they've ever pulled in. My question is, is what are you doing to help the person next to you? Don't you wanna wake up and go to work for the only reason that you can do something good for someone else? Wouldn't you want them to do that for you? By ourselves as individuals, we are not very good. Um, we cannot lift heavy weights by ourselves and we cannot solve complex problems by ourselves. But in groups, we are remarkable. And so all of this stuff, whether it's life, whether it's whatever your job was in the service, whatever your job is out of the service, whether it's finding a new job, um, whether it's making your way, finding out sort of what your passion is. All of these things are incredibly difficult. They're all incredibly complicated. And the person who thinks that they can tackle any of these problems by themselves is a fool. Plain old, you're a fool. You cannot. I'm going to tell you, you cannot do it alone. And so asking for help 
is perhaps the greatest single thing anyone can ever learn, especially where everything is new and the stresses are different and often feel overwhelming and scary, totally unfamiliar. And the longer you are in the service, the scarier it is. Um, because this is, you had 15 years doing one thing, knowing one thing, learning a culture, and now not only is it new, people don't even understand what you did and what you know. The military is one of the most misunderstood cultures in the world. It's so closed and insular that people just don't know it. So you're dealing with that as well. And so to ask for help in any form is brilliant. I, this is the single thing that completely transformed my own culture. I had a small business. I quit my job and started my own marketing uh, consultancy a bunch of years ago. And for a few years, I ran on force of personality and it was great. But then if you have a little bit, little bit of success, force of personality doesn't work anymore. And all of a sudden things started crashing on in around me because I couldn't, I couldn't do it all. And I thought I had to know all the answers. And if I didn't, I pretended that I did because I thought that's what I had to do. And I learned, uh, I learned the very, very hard way where I came. It was a dark period that I had to learn to ask for help. And it turns out I was surrounded by people who wanted to help me. They just didn't because they didn't know I wanted it or needed it. And it was the willingness to ask for it or accept it that transformed my life and put me on the path that I'm on now. Now I'm really open about it. I can tell you stuff I'm really good at. And I'll tell you I'm good at that. And I'll tell you I am not good at that. I need help with that. If I'm struggling or if I'm stuck, if I'm confused, I say, can I ask you? I call up friends. I call up people, mentors, and say, I need your help. Can you help me? And here's what I've learned about the building of trust. We don't build trust by offering people our help. We build trust by asking people for help. That's what actually creates trust because it's an expression of vulnerability, right? It allows people off to offer us safety and protection. And that's an act of service for the other person. Listening is a trust building exercise, right? Take it down to a personal relationship. If you've, been in a, if you've ever had a romantic relationship, a loved one, right? Making someone feel heard doesn't mean you're wrong. Saying sorry doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means you take accountability for your, for your actions. And I think it is important that when somebody objects to vaccination, that we don't demonize or villainize them, but we attempt to hear them, make them feel heard. Doesn't mean we have to agree, but they have to feel heard. And, you know, listening is not hearing the words. It's making the other person feel that they were heard. We don't get to decide when hearing has happened, when listening is happened, they do. And by the way, it's not 100% successful either, you know, because some people are just hell-bent on, and it, and, but that's a minority. And so I think the exercise is sitting down with people and say, tell me, tell me what's, what you're going through. Tell me what you're afraid of. I, I want to understand because we're trying to make everyone safe. I, I, want, to, I want to hear what, what your thing is. And let them tell their story. We have no answers. We're not there to object. We're not there to react. We're not there to fix or tell them that they're wrong. Women are better than this than men. And I think that has to happen. And it can happen simultaneously. They are not mutually exclusive. I'll give you one, one example, which is I have a friend who refused to get vaccinated. And I sat down with her and I said, tell me, tell me your reasoning, right? She goes, well, this new technology, like, I don't want to, we don't know, it hasn't been out long enough. Like, we don't know. So what I hear is fear of the unknown, okay? I go, go on. And she, I let her talk and say her thing and explain all the, the things. And I, and, and then, and I simply said, so you're afraid of the mRNA technology, right? Yes. I don't want them screwing with my DNA. I said, well, just so you know, it's 20 year old technology, but then I found something I could agree with her, but, but you're right. It is the first time it's been commercialized. You're absolutely right. That's the first time we've put it in the market. So I affirmed her fear. And then I said, do you get flu shots every year? She goes, I do. I said, okay, Johnson & Johnson is a good old fashioned flu shot. It's a different technology. It's not mRNA. So I, you're 100% right. If you're afraid of, of the new technology, don't get Moderna or Pfizer. But Johnson & Johnson is it's just like a flu shot. It's the same old tech. And she went, it is? And it is. She went and got a Moderna shot. <laughs>
because she just wanted to be heard because most of her friends, when she said, I'm not getting vaccinated, yelled at her, told her she was stupid, told her she's an idiot, told her she's letting her friends down, told her she's making other people sick, told her she's a risk to society. That doesn't make somebody's mind open up. All I did was let her feel heard. I think we do. We can't. We have to do that. I think some people turn off the humanity when they go to work. You know, they, 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 they may be, you know, loving parents and loving friends and loving, you know, uh, uh, children to their own parents. And yet, for some reason, there's a switch that they think that that's irresponsible to do at work. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily wearing your heart on your sleeve every day. There is something called emotional professionalism. You know, if you're having a bad day, you can say, listen, I'm, I'm a little off my game today, but you can't sit in the meeting with your arms folded and be grumpy and give one word answers. That's, that's emotionally unprofessional. You know, you can have hard feelings, but you can't go around screaming and yelling at people. So I think there's a, there is emotional professionalism. But I think for some reason, especially as people make their way up the ranks, they think that expressing any kind of emotion is a sign of weakness. Um, even that word vulnerability, we talk, you know, it's such a common word now being talked about in, in the business world that you have to be vulnerable. T to this day, it makes some people feel very uncomfortable. I don't want to be vulnerable. Well, all vulnerability means is saying things like, I don't know, or I need help, or I'm overwhelmed, or can you, you know, can you help me do this because I don't know how to do this, or I've been promoted to a position where maybe I need more training. And the reason we're afraid of saying that is for fear that it makes us look weak, which will then damage our careers. The reality is the total opposite. By saying I don't know means someone can help us. But instead, we choose to lie, hide, and fake very often, which eventually gets revealed. Enough stress piled on, and that lying, hiding, and faking collapses either professionally or personally. We either, we, we either feel the stress or, or the projects that we're working on start to go haywire. And very often, when we get to those points, everybody knows anyway. And uh, the amazing thing that I've learned is when you say, um, can somebody help me? Um, we're surrounded by people who would love, would love to help us. They just didn't think we needed it because we acted as if we didn't. So I think a, a large part of it is, is quite frankly, fear. Fear that if I express these things, that, it'll, that people will think I'm not qualified for my job. The, the, the opposite is true. And remember, when you are in a position of leadership, you don't actually have to be better uh, at doing the job that the people you lead. You have to be responsible for taking care of them to make sure they're good at their job. But for some reason, we think that I have to be better than you at your own job because I'm the leader. Completely false. I just have to make sure that you're equipped, you have the tools, the training, and the uh, psychological safety to, com to be the best you can be, even if it's better than me. Success is an elusive thing, right? What is it? And I think it's very interesting that if most people can't define success, well, it means you made X amount of dollars, or, but if you make X amount of dollars, but you spend more, are you successful? Or, well, it means you come home happy every day. Okay, how do you know when you're happy, you know? So I think success is a funny thing, which is we all seem to pursue it, but we don't know how to measure it or actually how to define it. So how do you pursue something that you can't measure? Fascinating. So. When people say to me, how do you measure success? It's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Am I successful? I don't know. I mean, I had a good year last year. And what does that mean? Does that mean I made a lot of money? Does that mean I was really happy? Oh, I'll let you decide, right? Right. Um, maybe neither. Maybe both. I had a good year last year, but am I successful? And the answer is no. I don't feel I am because I'm trying to build a world that doesn't exist yet. I'm trying to build a world in which 90% of people go home at the end of the day feeling fulfilled by the work that they do. So I definitely took a step, a big step forward towards that goal, but I'm still so far away. So somebody said to me, then how do you know if you're successful? And the answer is, if it can go by itself. And so what is more interesting to me as a measurement of success is not the, the markers per se. It's not the, the financial goal or the, the size of the house that you want to buy. Those are nice things. Go for it. Those are, but those are not measurements of success. Those are just nice things to collect along the way. For me, it's momentum. I want to measure momentum, which is, you know, when, when something is moving and you start to see it lose momentum, you're like, uh-oh, give it a push, because if you don't give it a push, it's going to stop. And an object in stasis is much harder to get going. It requires a lot more energy to get something started than it does to keep it going, right? And so if you don't let it stop and you can keep it going, it's this, you know, it still might slow down down there, but you can get it going again much easier. And for me, the opportunity is to get the ball rolling faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like a snowball. And my responsibility is because it's not rolling downhill yet. It's not on automatic yet. I need to still keep it going to find that critical mass where it can go. And at the point it can go by itself without me, then I will find something else to do. And that may not happen in my lifetime.
I, I think we must all stop measuring promotions, salaries, and these things, but rather measure the momentum of your career. Does my career have momentum? Can I see it moving in the right direction? Can I see it gathering moss? You know, can I see that it's easy, becoming easier for me to keep the momentum? It's becoming easier for me to grow the size of this thing. It's, it's requiring less effort. That's the thing we need to measure. That's the thing that we need to be cognizant of, which is the momentum of our career is not just the, the markers that we think define our success. Dopamine is the feeling uh, that you found something you're looking for or that you accomplished something you set out to accomplish. So you know that feeling you get when you cross something off your to-do list? That's dopamine. Feels awesome. You know when you when you have a goal to, to hit and you achieve that goal, you're like, yes! You feel like you won something, right? That's dopamine. The whole purpose of dopamine is to make sure that we get stuff done, right? The historical reason for dopamine, we would never eat if we only waited to get until we got hungry because there's no guarantee that we would find food. So dopamine exists to help us go looking for food. We get dopamine when we eat, which is one of the reasons we like eating. And so when you see something that reminds you of something that feels good, we want to do the behavior that helps us get that feeling, right? So let's say you're out there going for a walk and you see an apple tree in the distance. You get a small hit of dopamine. And then what it does is it focuses us on our goals. And now we start walking towards the apple tree. And as the apple tree starts to get a little bigger, we feel like we're making progress. You get another little shot of dopamine and another little shot of dopamine until you get to the tree and you're like, yes! Okay, this is why we're told you must write down your goals. Your goals must be tangible. There's a, there's a biological reason for that. We, we're very, very visually oriented animals. You have to be able to see the goal for it to biologically stay focused, right? If you don't write down your goals, if you can't see your goals, it's very hard to get motivated, to get inspired. For example, think about corporate visions, right? A corporate vision has to be something we can see, right? That's why it's called a vision. You can see it, right? To be the biggest, most respected, to be the fastest growing are not visions. They're nothing, right? What does that even look like? Respected by whom? Your mother, yourself, your friends, your shareholders? Who knows? What's the metric? Dunno. It's amorphous, doesn't motivate us. Just like I can't tell you, you will get a bonus if you achieve more. You're gonna ask me how much more? I'm gonna say more. Doesn't work. You need a tangible goal. You need a tangible goal, right? Here's a great vision. Martin Luther King, I have a dream that one day little black children and little white children will play on the playground together and hold hands together. We can imagine that. We can set our sights on that. And every time we achieve a goal and achieve a metric and achieve a milestone that makes us feel like we're making progress to the, go the vision we can see, we keep going and going and going until we achieve something remarkable. You have to be able to see it. Dopamine. Like I said, dopamine is the feeling you get when you set out to find something you're looking for as well. Talked about the to-do list. I came home from a trip just a couple days ago and I had a bunch of errands to run and I wrote down a little list of things I had to do and off I went, right? And I was walking past something. I remembered, oh, I have to do that and I hadn't written it down on my, I hadn't written down on my to-do list. So I went in and finished what I needed to do. And then when I came out, I then wrote it on my to-do list and then crossed it out. Because I wanted the dopamine. Feels good. <laughs> dopamine comes with a warning. Dopamine is highly, highly, highly addictive. Here are some other things that release dopamine. Alcohol, nicotine, gambling, your cell phone, Oh, you think I'm joking. Okay, we've all been told that uh, if you wake up in the morning and you crave a drink, you might be an alcoholic. Well, if you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is check your phone before you even get out of bed, you might be an addict. If you walk from room to room in your own apartment holding your telephone, you might be an addict. When you're driving in your car and you get a text and your phone goes beep, we, we hate email, true. We love the beep, the buzz, the ding, oh. Right? You'll be there in 10 minutes, and yet you have to look at it right now. You might be an addict. And even if you read it and it says, are you free for dinner next Thursday, and you have to reply immediately, you can't wait the 10 minutes, you might be an addict. And for all you Gen Ys out there who like to think that you're better at multitasking because you grew up with the technology, then why do you keep crashing your cars when you're texting? You're not 
you're not better at multitasking, you're better at getting distracted. In fact, if you look at the statistics, ADD and ADHD have, uh, diagnoses of ADD and ADHD have risen 66% in the past 10 years. Okay, ADD and ADHD is a frontal lobe disorder, right? Are you telling me out of nowhere, 66% of our youth has the frontal lobe problem? Where did that come from? No, it's a misdiagnosis, right? What, what, are, the, what are the symptoms of a dopamine addiction to technology? Distractibility. Inability to uh, to get things done easily easily distracted, you know Shortness of attention. It's all the same thing. So we misdiagnose things. It's this it's the addictive quality of dopamine We can also get addicted to performance in our companies when all they do is give us numbers to hit numbers to hit numbers to hit And a bonus you get and a bonus you get and a bonus you get all they're doing is feeding us with dopamine And we can't help ourselves all we do is want more 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 It's no surprise that the banks destroyed the economy because one of the things we know about dopamine addict is they will do anything to get another hit, sometimes at the sacrifice of their own resources and their relationships. Ask any alcoholic gambling addict or, or drug addict. Ask, ask them how their relationships are doing and if they've squandered any of their resources. It's an addiction. Dopamine is dangerous if it is unbalanced. It is hugely helpful when in a comfortable and balanced system, but when unbalanced, it's dangerous and it's destructive. You cannot have innovation or progress without failure. It doesn't exist. Uh, and if you truly aren't failing as you're trying to innovate, then you're probably not pushing very hard because you haven't broken anything. You're, taking, you're making very, very safe choices. We could never put a person on the moon without a bunch of rockets blowing up first. Like, of course. I, I, I met a CFO once. I asked him the priorities of the company and he said, efficiency and innovation. And I laughed and said, well, good luck with that. You know, innovation is inherently inefficient because it requires experimentation, and experimentation requires failure. Much is said about fail fast. I actually don't like the term that we, I think we overuse the term failure. You know, the problem with the word failure is it's like the word cancer. It's too broad. Like if you have stage four liver cancer or you have a mild melanoma, those things are both called cancer, but they are clearly not the same thing. And the same thing is when we hear the word failure. Some people think failure means experimentation, but a lot of people think failure means catastrophe. And so when we tell our company, failure is good, fail fast, that literally scares people. We don't want to fail. So I think we need a new word, right? We want to avoid failure. Failure is catastrophic and it should be avoided. But falling, I think we should encourage. You know, when a kid falls off a bicycle, we didn't tell them they failed. We tell them they fell. And what do we tell them? Get back up and try again. So I don't want to tell people they fail. I want to see people they fell. And I want to encourage them to try again and you know, brush off their knees. So I think we should fall and fall often. And I will judge the quality of innovation, not necessarily by if you fell, but how quickly you can pick yourself back up and try again. I think courage is external, right? The reason someone has courage to jump out of an airplane is because there's a parachute on their back. It's the external thing. A world famous trapeze artist would never try a brand new death defying act for the first time without a net. It's the net that gives them the courage. The Navy SEALs are considered one of the highest performing organizations on the planet. And a former SEAL was asked, what kind of person makes it into the SEALs? And he said, I can't tell you the kind of person that makes it in, but I can tell you the kind of person that doesn't make it in. He said the star college athletes who have never really been tested to the core of their being, none of them make it in. He said, the preening leaders who like to delegate everything, none of them make it in. He says, the guys who show up with hulking muscles covered in tattoos because they want to show you how tough they are, none of them make it in. He said, that, he said, some of the guys who make it in are skinny and scrawny. He said, some of the guys who make it in, you see them shivering out of fear. He said, but every single one of the guys who makes it in, when they're emotionally exhausted, when they're physically exhausted, when they have absolutely nothing left to give, somehow, some way, they're able to dig down deep inside themselves to find the energy to help the guy next to them. In other words, the reason these organizations and these people have the courage to do remarkable things is not because of their internal strength. It's because they have the absolute confidence that there is someone to the left of them and someone to the right of them that cares about them. And they will know that. And it's the quality of the relationships that we maintain, professionally and personally, that give us the courage to do difficult things. Isaac Stern, the famous violinist, said, music is what happens between the notes. Well, something like trust happens between the meetings. 
You know, we, few people think about the importance of building trust when they go to work or the, what do I need to do today to build trust with somebody? Like that's, that doesn't really go through people's minds. But we have chit chat as we walk into the meeting. We've chit chat when we walk out of the meeting and we see somebody in the hall, they're like, oh, meant to tell you something. Or you knock on someone's door and be like, got a minute? And all those little innocuous interactions over the course of time, like any relationship, build trust. Uh, it's about setting up the computer, setting up Zoom and having a work session with somebody. You know, like we're not working on the same thing, but I want to work with somebody, a work buddy, or having a, a, a lunch with somebody over Zoom, or a Monday morning huddle where we talk about what's on our heart and minds, but we do not talk business on purpose, or Friday uh, cocktails that are just voluntary. But the most important one is to just pick up the phone and call people and say, how are you? That level of empathy, just check in on someone. And I think we neglect it because we get mired in the day to day. But, you know, one of you know, if you're organized or disorganized, you know, literally keep a list of your team on a little card next to your computer and just, you know, go through it. And have I called this person in a while and talked to this person? I'm just going to call and check in. It doesn't matter if something's wrong or not wrong. Just check in on them. You know, don't wait for something to break and let people know that there, uh, that there's connection and there's a way to reach out and say, I need help. And the most important thing is for leaders to be honest and open about their need to ask for help. And that That'll work. And how happy are you? Think about it. In your relationships, in your work or career, in your spiritual life. Are you as happy as you want to be? There are some who believe that wanting to be happy is the same thing as being selfish. But really, when you are truly happy, you're feeling joy. Aren't you a better you? Don't you vibrate on a higher level? Don't you love more deeply when you are happy? All of us will continue to discover that being happy is not only a good thing, but it is essential to that connection that we call soul. Feeling good is feeling God. How happy are you? The quiz we're going to give you is one of the most widely used tools in the study of true happiness. There are people who study happiness, and here is how it works. You have to answer these five questions on a scale of one to seven. Seven would be the highest. Number one, this is a question. Answer this. In most ways, my life is close to ideal. Number two, the conditions of my life are excellent. Number three, I am satisfied with my life. Number four, so far, I've gotten the important things I want in life. Number five, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. Okay, now, add up your score. So if you scored between 31 and 35, you are considered extremely satisfied, okay? If you scored 15 or below, you are considered dissatisfied with your life. And if you scored somewhere in between, you might have a lot of work to do. You are, you are really feeling bad about yourself. I go, so the day that I took this test, I was really very sad because my, my little dog, Sophie, who I've had for 12 years, has had kidney failure. And on that day, the doctor told me that I had to put her down. Very sad. And I realized as I was walking, I was literally walking around crying because of Sophie. And then I realized I could change the way I felt about it. That I could think about all the wonderful times that I've had with her and what a comfort she's been in my life and it changed the way I felt about it. Oprah, you make a, such an important point because I think for happiness, a lot of times we're looking outside of ourselves for everything to be right. For what's going on today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But when you talk about happiness, I think you're really talking about Joy. Joy. That's exactly. You're talking about something that's inside you and it's in there regardless of how your day is and what's going on in your life. And this is the big secret to happiness. What I find is, is when people remember that there's a place in them where they're already happy and they can connect to that place, then, you know, that's the key to happiness but ultimately. How can you remember that you're already happy if you've never connected to that place? 
Well, that's exactly true. Most of us haven't had the education or the example to show us that actually there is this innate happiness just waiting for us to make contact with it. And where is it? Well, I think the secret is based on some very timeless principles. And it starts with a very wild idea, which is actually that the physical world, it doesn't really exist. It's a mental world. And actually, we project ourselves onto the world. Yeah. Absolutely. And what did your spiritual teacher tell you? Well, he said, look, actually, Robert, you're already happy. And I said, well, that's great, but I don't feel it. So tell me, what do I have to do? And he said, you have to understand that the pursuit of happiness can is, is a mistake. It's like you don't chase happiness out there. You learn that you're happy inside you, and then you go running. Then you go into the world. You were saying that your spiritual teacher told you, Robert, many years ago, that you can't pursue happiness, that you are already happy, and then you go out and do whatever it is that makes you feel fulfilled or whatever. Yeah, so we have to handle it right. Because you see, it's like if we forget that happiness is within us, then no matter how much we pursue it, we'll always feel like we're further away from it. That's right. And this is what's so interesting is there's something called destination. Oh yeah, destination addiction. Destination addiction is where you, you live in the not now. It's always about tomorrow. So you're chasing more next and there. And you promise yourself that when you get there, you'll be happy. And I promise you, you won't because you'll always set another destination. Yeah. And there's so many people watching us right now who are in positions that take a little bit of their spirit and they die a little bit every day because you're in a job that you hate. You're dealing with people every day surrounded by bosses that don't respect you and treat you badly. And so you die a little bit. I think one of the big keys in the workplace is, is the key to the happiness is not to have a job, it's to have a purpose. There's a big difference. Yes. And actually, you know, if leaders in the workplace were to be really smart, they would make sure that they supported people in having a purpose rather than just a job. Yeah. Because when you've got a purpose, I think you feel like you're making a difference. Right. And doing something. Actually, I was speaking at some university once, and that was the subject of my uh, speech. I was saying that you should not focus on success, but focus on significance and focusing on significance. How do you be significant in the world? How do you make significant contributions first to yourself then to your family and community, and then the world. And if you focus on that, then success automatic automatically comes. Completely yeah. true. And, and I think also, you know, the key to happiness is when you support other people in being happy. Yeah. It feels good. That's right. Yeah. Why do you think we're in a happiness slump? I will tell you, one of the most profound reasons, I think, is because everybody is looking at other people's social media, what they believe to be other people's lives, which is only a snapshot of other people's lives, and feeling envy about that. And one of the things that Arthur and I talk about in this book is that envy is the great destroyer. The happiness killer. It is the happiness killer. And so anytime you're, anytime you're looking at anything else with envy, you have already killed your own happiness or your ability to be happier in that moment and probably in moments to come. So I, coming from where I've come from, rural Mississippi, never imagining the life that I have, for a long time, I have felt that I had enough, even though I kept getting more. But inside myself, I feel that I am enough which is one of the great lessons. What is at the root of most people's dysfunction is that you don't think that you're good enough. You don't think that you're worthy. You don't own your own essence and your own power. I wonder, how would you advise, given everything that you've been through in your life and talked about in your childhood, how does one take agency over their life and their happiness? I know this that many of the things that have happened to you have also happened for you. And that I learned when the crisis or the challenge showed up for me, I immediately would ask, sometimes out loud, but certainly in my own conscious spirit, what is this here to teach me? And how can I get that lesson as soon as possible? And this I guarantee you, the moment you have the conscious realization of, oh, this is why 
This is here. Showing up to allow me to see whatever that is in your life, the changes for you. Unhappiness is not the enemy. No, it is not the enemy. The unhappiness, and if actually, one of the things that's so powerful, I think about uh, what Arthur has written specifically is about how your emotions are there to allow you to feel the feel and then take the wheel of this feeling that I'm having. I'm having this feeling and now I need to do what? And not to allow yourself to be overcome by the feeling. So you have a feeling of anger, you have a feeling of sadness, you have a feeling of disappointment. Doesn't mean you are those things, you are those emotions. So now what am I gonna do now that I'm feeling disappointed about certain things? First of all, have a great understanding of your own identity and what is required for you to be happy. And to know the difference between your negative feelings and your emotions and your state of being. So my state of being is always a state of satisfaction, enjoyment, and purpose. So when I first started having conversations with families from, you know, different walks of life, that's when I came to understand that there is a common bond that we all share, that we're all really seeking the same things. And knowing that that thing was happiness came from the show. And every day I would sit and talk with the audience for a half hour, sometimes 40 minutes, a producer would be like, oh my God, when is she gonna let go of the audience? What I really want is to have a conversation with the audience to see why did you come and what did you get from the show and did you benefit at all and why do you watch, all of that. So 10 years in, the audience became my focus group. I would always ask people, what do you want? What would it take to make you happy? And most people, when I say, what do you want? They just say, I just want to be happy. Tell me what that looks like. And as the years progressed, women were more able to identify what that specifically was. But when I first started asking that question in the mid nineties, they would always just say, well, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Well, what does that look like? Define it. Define, define happy. Define it. And what I realize is that most people have never defined it. And then they'd say, well, I want my kids to be happy. Well, that's your kids, but what do you want? And so being able to answer specifically what that looks like for you is the beginning of being happier. Happiness is not a destination. Happiness is a direction. I know that was a shift in mindset for many who are reading this book. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, and you know, this is, the, the problem with happiness is such a funny thing because we all want it. Every philosopher and theologian has talked about it. Everybody, I mean, how, how, how many times have people said that on your show? I know, that's what I say in the beginning of the book that- Thousands you know, of times. Well, I became interested in this subject because every time I would sit with the audience and I'd say, what do you want? Everybody would always say, multiple people would answer, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Yeah. But yet when you ask them, what does that look like for them? Hard to define. It's, it's for sure. And part of the reason is because it's not something that you can define in any meaningful way. We think it's a feeling. We think it's a destination. Mm -hmm. It isn't either. It, you know, happy feelings are nothing more than emotions and emotions are nothing more than information that we need in reaction to the outside environment. And, and as a destination, what would you, why would you want to be completely happy as the destination? You'd be dead in a week because you actually need negative emotions and experiences to train you, to keep you vigilant, to keep you safe and to be happy. Yeah, to keep you alert, to keep you, to keep you on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, maybe when I die and I'm in heaven, and I see the face of God, the beatific vision will be pure happiness. But on earth, I'm telling you, I need my negative emotions mm -hmm. to keep me alive and safe. I need my negative experiences to learn and grow. And so that's what people, they, they want to stay alive and safe, uh -huh. but they don't want the feelings that keep them alive and safe. And yeah. that's this conflict that they have, which is why they feel so unsettled. Okay, so I think, particularly in this world of social media, people think if I just get that, I mean, I, I, I see people toasting on private jets and I see them, you know, on beaches and, right. you know, hair, their hair blowing in the wind and all that. And people think, well, if I just had that, I, I could be happy. But we know 
you yeah. have the science to back it up, that there are really four pillars. And if you right. don't have all of those pillars working in your life, you will eventually end up feeling not necessarily sad, but lonely or distanced or disconnected. That's right. So the four pillars yeah, are. Yeah, the four pillars. There's, there's kind of the four pillars you think that you need and those four pillars that you really do need. The idols, the things that look right but aren't, are money, yes. power, pleasure, and fame. Those are the things that Mother Nature says, you get those, you're going to be happy. Money, power, pleasure, and fame. That's right, but she lies. Mother Nature lies. She lies a lot because she wants us to keep running, 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 yeah. right? Because but is my, Mother Nature telling us that or is society telling us that? Because well, I think Mother Nature is telling us the, that it's the four pillars. Well, Mother Nature gives us these imperatives because she wants us to, wants us to be hungry. You know, and, and she wants us to survive and pass on our genes. Yes. And the way that you do that is with money, power, pleasure, and fame, right? And she doesn't want us to figure out that those things never really satisfy so that we'll keep running and running and running. That's called the hedonic treadmill. You're right what we really want, and this is backed up by, by, by a lot of psychology, neuroscience, behavioral economics, all the research that we want, mm -hmm. is that there's kind of four things that are the virtuous things that we should be looking for. The Mother Nature doesn't necessarily tell us, but that if we take the divine path in life, mm -hmm. religious or not religiously understood, a better path in life, mm -hmm. we'll be happy. And those are our faith, family, friends, and work that serves. Now, if you give any teenage kid the choice between money, power, pleasure, and honor, or faith, faith Family, family, friends, you know, good and friends work. and good times and a yeah. work that serves others. I mean, They're what gonna, are they going to take? Yeah. Right? I mean, our society does aid and abet Mother Nature's lie. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the marketing colossus tells us that if you get that car, man, you're going to be really happy. If you get that job, you get that money. If you get that 100,000 Instagram followers or whatever your number happens to be, it's never yeah. high enough, by the yeah. way. You're going to be happy. But that's a lie is the bottom line. There's nothing wrong with those things. Yeah. But if you get those things, if we are so lucky to get those things, they should only ever be in service of the big four, the good four. They should only ever be in service. They should be intermediate goals. A rest stop on the New Jersey mm -hmm. Turnpike, Manhattan, where you're trying mm -hmm. to get, is faith. Faith. And by that... Yeah. yeah. How do you use that money, power, pleasure, and fame to enhance your faith, family, and work and friendship and friendships How basically you your love yeah. yes your the love in your life yeah and the love in the lives of the people around you that's yeah. really what those those worldly goals should be used for if you want to have any shot at true happiness yeah what's really the purpose of life if you can give an insight on that isn't it fantastic that if there's no purpose you have nothing to fulfill you can just live no but you want a purpose and not a simple purpose, you want a God-given purpose. It's very dangerous. People who think they have a God-given purpose are doing the cruelest things on the planet. Yes or no? They are doing the most horrible things and they've always been doing the most horrible things. Because when you have a God-given purpose, life here becomes less important than your purpose. No, life is important. Life is important. When I say life, I am not talking about your family, your work, what you do, what you do not do, your party. I am not talking about that as life. This is life, isn't it? Life is within you or around you. The ambience of life, you are mistaking the ambience of life for life. Your home, your family, your workspace, your party, this is all ambience of life, this is not life, isn't it? Yes or no? You're mistaking the ambience for the real thing, no. Life is important because it's the only thing you know, you don't know anything else. Do you know something else? Rest is all imagined stuff, isn't it? The only thing is that this is beating and alive and that's all there is. It is of paramount importance. Not you as a person, that's not important. But you as a piece of life, it's very important. Because that is the basis of everything. When I say that is the basis of everything, the universe exists for you only because you are, isn't it? Yes or no? The world exists for you only because you are, otherwise it wouldn't exist in your experience. So, in every way this is important. So what is the purpose for this? 
See, if you had a purpose and if you fulfilled it, after that what would you do? Bored, isn't it? It is just that life is so intricate and so phenomenally intricate that if you spend ten thousand years looking at it carefully, you still will not know it entirely. If you spend a million years looking at it with absolute focus, still you will not know it in its entirety. That's how it is. There is… is there a meaning to it? The greatest thing about life is that there is no meaning to it. This is the greatest aspect of life, that it has no meaning to it and there is no need for it to have a meaning. It is the pettiness of one's mind that it is seek a meaning, because psychologically you will feel kind of unconnected with life if you don't have a purpose and a meaning. People are constantly trying to create these false purposes. Now, they were quite fine and happy, suddenly they got married, now the purpose is the other person. Then they have children, now they become miserable with each other, now the whole purpose that I go through all this misery is because of the children. Like this it goes on. These are things that you are causing and holding these as purposes of life. And is there a God-given purpose? What if God does not know you exist? No, I'm just asking by chance. I'm saying in this huge cosmos for which God is supposed to be the creator and the manager of this hundred billion galaxies in that this tiny little planet and you, suppose he doesn't know that you exist, what to do? Possible or no? I'm sorry, I'm saying such sacrilegious things, but is it possible or no? What if he doesn't know that you exist? What if he doesn't have a plan for you? Don't look for such things. The thing is, the creation is made in such a way that creation and creator cannot be separated. Here you are a piece of creation, at the same time the source of creation is throbbing within you. If you pay little attention to this process of life, you would not need any purpose, it'll keep you engaged for a million years if you want. There is so much happening. So much means so much unbelievable things are happening right here. If you pay enough attention, a million years of existence, it'll keep you busy or more. Right now the need for purpose is calm because you are trapped in your psychological structure, not in your life process. Your psychological structure functions from the limited data that it has gathered. Within that, it rolls and right now, your thought and emotion has become far more important than your life, isn't it so? So because of this, you are seeking a purpose as an escape from the trap that you have set for yourself. It is a trap set by you, you can easily come out of it. If the trap was set for you by somebody else, difficult to come out because they'll set the trap in such a way that you cannot come out, isn't it? So this is a trap set by you. This is easy to come out, but that is the whole thing. Why it is so difficult is, now you're identified with the trap, you like it. You like it, because it gives you a certain sense of safety and security and protection and individual identity. If you build a cocoon around yourself, it gives you safety, but it also imprisons you. Walls of self-preservation are also walls of self-imprisonment. When it protects you, you like it. When it restricts you, you do not like it. That is why we have doors, we like the walls because it's protecting us. But we have doors so that we can open it and get out when we want to. It doesn't matter how nice it is, we still want to go out, isn't it? So that is how it is with every trap that you set. It doesn't matter how nice it is, you still want to go out. So the psychological wall that you have built, which gives you a sense of identity, which gives you some sense of being a person 
an individual person and which gives you security, beginning to experience it like a trap, somewhere you want to break it. So one way of not breaking it is to find a purpose. Those who find a purpose in their life, they become so conceited. They will live within their own trap forever, thinking that they're doing the most fantastic thing. First thing you need is balance. If you have balance, then you can climb. If you don't have balance, it's better you stay on the ground, isn't it? It's not safe for somebody who is not balanced to climb high. It's best you stay close to the ground, you should not climb. So, first thing is to establish a balance. Then you lose in your psychological structure. Then it's a wonderful thing. If you lose in your psychological structure without balance, which a lot of people are doing today, see why does somebody want to drink alcohol or take a drug? Because it loosens your psychological structure and makes you feel liberated for a moment. But without the necessary balance, you have not worked for the balance, but you got freedom. Freedom without balance is destruction, anarchy, isn't it? So, first thing is to work for balance, an enormous sense of balance, where even if you dismantle your psychological structure, you can simply live here. Dismantling your psychological structure is an important process because that is your trap, that is your security, that is your stability, at the same time that's your trap because the walls are set, you feel secure, but that's also your trap. If you dismantle your trap, you also dismantle your security, isn't it? You also dismantle your sense of purpose, you also dismantle everything that matters to you. So that will need balance. Without balance, if you dismantle, you will go crazy. But don't look for a purpose, because if you look for a purpose, you're seeking madness. If you find one, you are sure mad. Yes. If you think you found a purpose in life, you for sure gone crazy. Because only the insane people have purpose. Or people who have purpose are insane in many ways. These are things that you create in your mind and believe it's true, isn't it? Right now, fighting for my country is my purpose. Right now, if it's necessary, I will fight. Knowing fully well, it's an unnecessary bloody fight. Then you will fight only to the extent it's necessary. If you think this is your purpose, you would want to destroy the whole world for what nonsense you believe in, isn't it? Something is needed, we'll do it. With absolute involvement, there's no other purpose. The purpose of life is to live and to live totally. To live totally does not mean party every night. To live totally means before you fall dead, every aspect of life has been explored, nothing has been left unexplored. Yes? Before you fall dead, even if you do not explore the cosmos, at least this piece of life you must know it in its entirety. That much you must do to yourself, isn't it? That's living totally. That you experience the whole of this, all dimensions of what this is. You did not leave anything untouched. You just do that, that will take a long time. That's enough, good enough purpose for you. So this is the nature of a human being. Whatever you're deprived of, you think that is the highest thing. Whatever you don't have, looks like at that moment, that is the highest. If you have not eaten for two days, Food will be God, yes or no? If you don't understand this, close your mouth, hold your nose like this for two minutes. Will you ask for air or God? God comes and says, you want me or air? You'll say, hell with you, I want to breathe. <laughs> because whatever at that moment you're deprived of, that becomes, takes on a, enlarges itself in such a way, it blocks everything out. Or in other words, when you're in any state of compulsiveness, you don't see anything the way it is, it gets exaggerated. If your bladder is full, one minute, I'm talking about enlightenment. Your bladder is very full. Are you interested? 
I don't want any enlightenment. Right now, going to the bathroom feels like ultimate liberation. Yes or no? So just about anything, when you're in a state of compulsiveness, you don't see anything the way it is. Life will get distorted to make you think that that is it at that moment. So like this, human life passes from one, comp one compulsive state to another, never allowing yourself that little bit of space where you could see things the way they are. If you do not even see life the way it is, can you handle it the way it needs to be handled? It doesn't arise, isn't it? If you don't see things the way they are, you can never handle it the way it needs to be handled. Because of this, in many ways, individual human lives and all societies have become distorted humanity. When I say distorted, it's normal, I mean normal. I was talking to a 14, 15 year old kids in a school and uh, I couldn't believe that I was talking to about 11, 12 of them, young boys and girls. When something came up and I was just asking them what are they going to do next because they were in their 10th standard or something. They're only talking about finding a job and earning a living. I, I couldn't believe this because my whole life I never thought of earning a living. My dear father is to break his head. This boy has no fear in his heart. What will happen to him? What will happen? I said not having fear is a problem. I thought fear is a problem. I never thought not having fear is a problem. <laughs> According to the dictates of the divine, I was supposed to become a doctor because my father is a doctor. At the age of 10, I told him, no, that's one thing I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be a doctor. But every day, somebody is trying to work on me. You must become a doctor. You must become a doctor. You know, Indian family. You must become a doctor. If you cannot, of course, now they've all shifted to software. I was in Chicago, just to, you know, eight days, just two days ago I came to India. So one week ago, eight days ago, I was in Chicago and uh, an Indian person came and I asked, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> what else Sadhguru? That means he's a software engineer. There was a time if you said, what else, you were a doctor. Now if you say, what else, it means you're a software engineer. It is not because they are phenomenally interested in human physiology, they became doctors. Not because they are, have an electronic, this thing, they became a software engineer, just to earn a living. Is it not important? I'm not saying it's not important, all I'm saying is, even an ant, which is one millionth of your brain, is capable of earning a living. What's your problem with such a big brain? Why I'm saying this is, this idea, this horribly limiting idea has been imposed into the, our youths that you must earn a living and that's the biggest thing. This big brain, earning a living is actually a problem on this planet. I know everybody's been conditioned to believe that. It's not so, I'm telling you. It is not so. Earning a living is a petty thing for human consciousness. But unfortunately, all humanity is investing all its energies and intelligence in just earning a living. If this one thing does not change in the world, that I'm not saying one should not, all I'm saying is, it need not occupy the entirety of human consciousness to earn a living. If you put one little finger to work, it'll earn a living. It's capable, this is capable of that. All human genius has been smothered to death simply because everybody is thinking how to earn a living, how to earn a living, you know. The moment they can earn a living, they will sit down and become fat. You must be seeing, what can I do with this life, isn't it? You must be seeing, what is the greatest thing I can do with this life? Because one day you'll fall dead, do you know? Do you know you'll fall dead one day? So before you die, whatever is the peak possibility for this life should happen, isn't it? I earn my living, I earn my living. This is a big pride. Why don't you see 
every insect every worm every bird every animal every creature on this planet is earning a living what is such a what is there to be so proud of about i earn my own living everybody is earning their own living isn't it only human beings are making a big issue out of it too big issue when i look at it how human intelligence has been sacrificed at the altar of earning a living is unbelievable how many things human beings could have done how many incredible things they could have done but instead of that they're earning a living so it's very very important i'm i'm just thinking we should start a wave particularly in schools and colleges that earning a living is not is a damn little thing it is not the prime of your life with one little finger you can earn a living with this big brain when an ant can earn its living this big brain should it struggle to earn a living that has become a problem because you want to be like somebody else isn't it you want to be like somebody else that ends life's ship and once you are into this chakra nothing else is possible it just keeps you going and going and going endlessly now this possibility of this simple thing called yoga is not about twisting your body is not about getting fit it's not about getting healthy this all these things nature will do for you if only if you live in tune with it this is about understanding the geometry of the cosmos through the geometry of your own system i am calling this a geometry because cosmos is a geometry isn't it? planet earth is going around the sun what is it a diesel powered you think a big diesel engine is pushing it if it was the roar of the engine would have killed us just the perfection of geometry just keeps going and going and going isn't it the whole universe is geometrically perfect that's why it stays there otherwise it wouldn't and if you learn to hold your body in a certain way if the geometry of your body is in alignment with the geometry of the rest of the creation suddenly you will find there is a rapo a rapo which will allow you you can download the whole cosmos into this one probably these days you don't have this experience anymore because you got all tata sky dish net and all that stuff but if suppose you had a television in your home in 80s when first the doordarshan came you are watching your favorite cricket match suddenly your television was boom boom then you climb up the terrace and there it is one aluminum contraption if you do like this nothing will come if you do like this nothing will come you just get it to the right place ah the world pours into your sitting room this is just like that if you learn to just hold it right the whole cosmos will pour into you so engineering yourself does not mean engineering yourself to breathe little better to be little more healthy no this is about realizing the full potential of what it means to be human you're just a piece of life aren't you no no no, no that's not true you're a bundle of thoughts emotions ideas opinions and prejudices right now not a piece of life if you sat here just as a piece of life not as a man not as a woman not as this not as that not as a thought not as an emotion just a piece of life this would naturally reverberate with the rest of the existence and right now you invested too much on little things like earning a living and having this and having that and missing everything Oh should I not have this should I not have that having is not the problem clinging is the problem isn't it having is not the problem what you have you become that after some time and it's happening to you every little thing that you acquire is taking your life in some way isn't it all these things we acquire thinking that these things will make our life 
We got this gadget because we thought it will make our life. Right now, this gadget has become a nuisance. We can't keep our hands off it. We're doing such some messaging somebody. Communication, of course, but not a communion. So, once you've come here, you should not leave this place without knowing the full depth and dimension of what this life is about, isn't it? Nobody should leave without knowing this because other things are subject to various realities. We do not know whether you will get to run 100 meters in 8 seconds, would you? You can't do that. We do not know whether you will climb Mount Everest or not. We do not know whether you will earn billion dollars or not. But this much is possible. You can explore the full depth and dimension of what this is because you don't need anybody's permission. You don't need any kind of anything. If you are willing, it's there, isn't it? You may be willing to climb Mount Everest, but your lungs may not be ready, your legs may not be ready. With this, it's not like that. It is not demanding any particular capability. It is not demanding any particular situation. Only your willingness. But you see, your willingness comes in installments. Nothing wrong if you had a 10,000 year lifespan. Nothing wrong. Fortunately, you don't have that because if you hung around for 10,000 years, oh, what a miserable world this will be. Isn't it? You may think whatever you want, but it's good you have come with an expiry date. Have you noticed on a particular day when you when you're very joyful, 24 hours just went off like a moment? You're miserable and depressed. One day goes like a eon. So only miserable people have a long life. Joyful people, even if they live to be hundred, it's too brief. Before you know what's happening, it'll be gone. Really, it gets over too fast. But if you're miserable, you will live long. So it's a very brief life. And whatever is of paramount importance to this life must happen at the earliest. Not day after tomorrow, isn't it? It must be today. So the life process doesn't wait. You need to understand your life is just a certain combination of time and energy. Energy we can manage, time you cannot manage, it's going away. It doesn't matter, you're awake, you're asleep, you're okay, you're not okay, you're happy, you're miserable. Going, going, going. As I'm talking, you're two minutes closer to the grave. Time you cannot manage, it's just going. You can only manage your energy, you can manage your activity, how you make use of the time you can manage. But you cannot manage time, it's slipping away, isn't it? So if you recognize that your life is just a certain amount of time and energy, you would definitely invest your energy. In a way, it is most meaningful to this life, isn't it? But if you do not understand this, if you intentionally forgetful about the briefness of life, and you go about as if you're eternal. Yes, you are eternal, aren't you? On a daily basis, you're not aware that life will end for me. And it could be today. Not to be terrified, just to be in tune with the fundamental facts of life, that it is possible that our lives could end today, isn't it? Possible? We are not intending, we are not seeking that, but it's possible, isn't it? If you miss this, then you'll miss your whole life. If you do not understand that you have an expiry date and it is not even fixed like a pharmaceutical product that you have another two years to live, it could be just about any time. If you miss this one fundamental fact, you're sure to miss your whole life because everything that's vital will be tomorrow and tomorrow never happens. There is a, a certain 
superstition in South India. Maybe it is here also, particularly in Karnataka, where on all the village homes, in red paint, it will be written, Nale Ba. Nale Ba means come tomorrow. They write it in red paint because devils will come wanting to enter your house and they can see only red. You didn't know this? Because they're looking for your blood. They can see only red color. So it's painted in red bay paint, Nale Ba. Devil comes to your house and says, okay, this house is tomorrow and goes away. But the fact is, most human beings have done this not to the devil but to the divine. If you've done it to the devil, it's okay, but you've done it to the divine, he <laughs> says it's <laughs> tomorrow. We'll meditate tomorrow. So, knowing life is not some superhuman effort. If you stop being some other rubbish and just become life, which is what you are, knowing life is not far away, it's right here. We bought into this complete falsehood that at some point you're going to have the courage, at some point you're going to have the confidence, and it's total, it's, it's complete garbage. And so there are so many people in the world, and you know, you may be watching this right now, and you have these incredible ideas, and what you think is missing is motivation. And that's not true. Because the way that our minds are wired, and the fact about human beings is that we are not designed to do things that are uncomfortable or scary or difficult. Our brains are designed to protect us from those things because our brains are trying to keep us alive. And in order to change, in order to build a business, in order to be the best parent, the best spouse, to do all those things that you know you wanna do with your life, with your work, with your dreams, you're gonna have to do things that are difficult, uncertain, or scary, which sets up this problem for all of us. You're never gonna feel like it. You, you only feel motivated to do the things that are easy, right? For me, one of the hardest things to figure out was why is it so hard to do the little things that would improve my life? And what I've come to realize and what we'll talk a lot about today is that the way that our minds are designed is our minds are designed to stop you at all costs from doing anything that might hurt you. And the way that this all happens is it all starts with something super subtle that none of us ever catch. And that is with this habit that all of us have that nobody's talking about. We all have a habit of hesitating. We have an idea, you're sitting in a meeting, you have this incredible idea, and instead of just saying it, you stop and you hesitate. Now, what none of us realize is that when you hesitate, just that moment, that micro moment, that small hesitation, it sends a stress signal to your brain. It wakes your brain up and your brain all of a sudden goes, oh, oh wait a minute, why, why is he hesitating? He didn't hesitate when he put on his killer spiky sneakers. He didn't hesitate with the uh, really cool track pants. He didn't hesitate with the NASA t-shirt. Now he's hesitating to talk, something must be up. So then your brain goes to work to protect you. It has a million different ways to protect you. One of them is called the spotlight effect. It's a known phenomenon where your brain magnifies risk. Why? To pull you away from something that it perceives to be a problem. And so you can truly trace every single problem or complaint in your life to silence and hesitation. Those are decisions. And what I do and what's changed my life is waking up and realizing that I'm never gonna feel like doing the things that are tough or difficult or uncertain or scary or new. So I need to stop waiting until I feel like it. And number two, I am one decision away from a totally different marriage, a totally different life, a totally different job, a totally different income, a totally different relationship with my kids. Not like one decision I'm divorcing you in the marriage example, but one decision on, you know, you could be having a conversation with your spouse and you feel your emotions rise up and within a tiny window, those emotions can take over and can impact how your marriage goes. Or you can learn how to take control of that micro moment 
and make a decision to act in a way that actually shifts your marriage. Your life comes down to your decisions, and if you change your decisions, you will change everything. When you set goals, when you have an intention on something that you wanna change about your life, your brain helps you. What it does is it opens up a checklist, and then your brain goes to work trying to remind you of that intention that you set. And it's really important to develop the skill, and I, I say that word purposefully, the skill of knowing how to hear that inner wisdom and that intention kicking in and leaning into it quickly. So for me, my brain saying, that's it, right there, move as fast as a rocket mill. I wanted to change my life. And I think most people that are miserable or that are, that are really like dying to be great and dying to have more, we want to change. We want to live a better life. We want to create more for our families. We want to be happier. The, the desire is there. Again, it's about how do you go from knowledge to action? So the first thing in this story that's important is realizing that the answer was in me. And my mind was telling me, pay attention. I mean, when I was 22, right after I graduated from Dartmouth, I was so focused on making everyone happy that I almost chose the worst possible career for my personality. It's not a bad career, it just would have been horrendous for me. I was interested in the environment, so I decided, oh, you know, I'll go get a law degree, and then I'll go work in Washington. And I think maybe I'll work on environmental policy, and I'd probably end up in some cube farm. And everyone was thrilled with the plan. Everyone, it turns out, but me. So here I am, I'm driving a U-Haul across country to go to law school and to get a degree in environmental law. And something started to gnaw at me. And with every single mile that I drove, my thoughts were getting louder and doubts were starting to pour in. My gut was telling me, Mel, turn the damn U-Haul around. But the problem was that everything was already in place, right? I mean, I'm already in the U-Haul. The thing is already packed. I'm already 10 miles into my drive. Um, the tuition had been paid for the first semester. I had signed a lease. I mean, I could not undo these things. Isn't that why it's so difficult for you to make changes in your life? Because you think that things can't be undone? The fact is, any excuse that you come up with, you can undo. Tuition can be reimbursed, apartments can be leased, plan B can be invented. So I got up, I repacked that U-Haul, and I drove out of town. I let myself make a U-turn in life. If you ever find your gut battling your head, save yourself the drama. I guarantee you your gut is right. Guarantee you your excuses can be undone. And I guarantee you you can make a U-turn in your life right now if you want to. Every single morning, Monday through Fridays at 9 a.m., I host a live call-in radio show on Sirius Satellite Radio. It's called Make It Happen with Mel Robbins. And the thing that's been so crazy about that show is every single person that calls me on that show, they call in because they're feeling stuck in their lives and they're resigned about their ability to change their lives. And I'm not talking about people that are nuts. I'm talking about successful people like you and me that just somehow got stuck in their lives. And I'm not talking about people that are looking for cheesy self-help. I'm talking about people that really want to figure out how to move themselves forward. And, you know, I find that so many of us think that our dreams are unreachable or unrealistic, and it's just so sad. I mean, people think that their dreams disappear. And if that's what you think, congratulations, you're officially stuck. And the truth is that our dreams are always there, and they don't ever give up on us. We give up on them. But here's the secret. If you just force yourself, and I mean force, because I know damn well none of you want to do anything about this, but if you just force yourself to take a couple small steps, there's always a surprise. So let's talk about Starbucks. Starbucks in 2008, very interesting thing happened, and many of you, if you were in the financial services market then probably know this, that their net income decreased by about 28% that year. And at the time, they had 16,000 stores in 44 countries, and they had gone through this massive, explosive growth 
segment in terms of going from going public in, I think it was like 1992, they only had 125 stores. And now here we are 2008, they've got 16,000. So what ends up happening is Howard Schultz, who was the chairman of the board, comes back in as the CEO. Very complex situation, right? You've got operations in 44 countries. You've got massive reduction in terms of the profits that you have. You've got the stock market and Wall Street screaming at you. You've got customers that are going to Dunkin' Donuts because there's a recession that's hitting. So what do you do? Well, he was very clear, again, back to the two rules. What do I stand for? Like, what is it, what, is, what am I doing? And what do I want the outcome to be? So he was very clear that what he stood for as a leader and what Starbucks should stand for is the Starbucks experience. He wanted to go back to the beginning and reintroduce people to the romance of having a cup of coffee. Because you know, that's how Starbucks launched in the beginning, that he was traveling and was over in Italy and was like, God, why don't we have places like these great stops to have a little cup of coffee over in the United States? Boom, Starbucks, an idea, it's born, it's launched. So he decides he's gonna do whatever he can to get the romance of having a cup of coffee back. In life, in any situation, whether you're talking about growing your company, growing your bank account, getting in a relationship, getting out of a relationship, getting something done at the school system that your kids are going to on behalf of your kids, whatever it is that you're up to in life, this is the only question that you need to ask yourself. Well, what is it that I want? Because the truth of the matter is, if you can answer that, you can have it. I eat only one meal a day most of the days. One big meal I eat and that's it. And doctors telling me, no, no, Sadhguru, the way you're traveling, this will happen, that will happen, you must eat at least once in four hours, something you must eat. I said, leave me alone, I'm doing fine. But now, a big university in America comes up with this called intermittent fasting. It's not nonsense, it's good. But they rediscovered something that we have known forever. Now everybody is saying there must be a 16-hour gap. Then, all your ailments will go away. What the hell were we saying all these thousands of years? The simple thing is, there are many, many aspects to this. Psychological, physiological. But now cancer is on the rise in the world. A cancerous cell is like a criminal in the society. All of us have in our bodies. Only if they become, their concentration becomes more than what they should be, or they gang up and lo locate themselves in one place, they become like organized crime. There are pickpockets in Kochi, I'm sure. Hello? Then small time criminals, individually operating, operating in twos and threes. Uh, we don't take it very seriously, we leave it because it happens. But suppose all hundred of them got organized into your organized crime, now we will crack down. Because we know now it becomes a threat to the society. Similarly, cancerous cells are like this. Criminals, they are moving around, doing some damage. Their only problem is, right now, they are generally eating about 8 to 12 times more than what the other cells are eating. So if you just give sufficient break between one meal and the other, most of them will die because they cannot survive. This is something we have been talking forever. But now they discovered it with a billion dollar research. Empty stomach and hunger are two different things. Hunger means your energy levels start dropping. But empty stomach is a good thing. In the yogic sciences, today modern science also is coming in line with this. But what we know by our experience, you will spend a billion dollars to come there. Because research is all about how many million dollars. That's how it is. Your body and your brain works at its best only when your stomach is empty. So we always make sure we eat in such a way, how much ever we eat, our stomach must be always empty within two to two and a half hours time maximum. So we go to bed hungry always. People think they cannot sleep. They can sleep. On an average, for 25 years on an average, I slept only two and a half to three hours. These days I'm getting little lazy and speaking, sleeping anywhere between three and a half to four and a half hours in spite of the level of travel that I have. When I say level of travel, 
if i say my level of travel in the next few days you will fall off your chair because in the next 10 days i'm in five different countries doing i don't know how many events all kinds of events so you are able to keep this up simply because you don't over eat it's very very important everybody eats two meals i generally eat only one meal 4:35 in the evening because i don't like to sit in front of the plate and worry about how much to eat i like to eat well so 4:35 in the evening if i eat a meal it's only next day any correction and purification that needs to happen in the body your stomach needs to be empty it's very very important otherwise the purification on the cellular level will not happen you pile up things and then you have all kinds of problem if food is not good enough to be touched i don't know how it's good enough to be eaten the cleanliness of your hands is entirely in your hands the cleanliness of the fork is not entirely in your hands and nobody else but you have used these hands as to how clean or not clean it is right now the fork you do not know who's used it how they've used it for what they used it and all they have to do is wipe it with a tissue and give it to you and it looks pretty clean above all you don't feel the food the first thing that's been taught to us is if food appears in front of you to hold your hands upon the food for a few moments just to feel how the food is if something appears on my plate if i just feel this i know what to eat and what not to eat what i do should not eat i don't taste it and then reject it i just don't eat because my hands are the first level not tasting in the sense the tongue tastes but knowing the food first thing is knowing the food uh, but the food that's going to become a part of you first thing is your hands even if you physically don't touch it just being conscious and being there it clearly tells you how the food will behave within you whether this particular food on this particular day should it go into you or not because every day your body is not the same thing every day every moment it's different if you feel the food you just know whether this food has to go into you on this day or not if that much awareness is brought in we don't have to go on telling people what they should eat every meal they must decide what they should eat in that meal there is no one prescription that this is what you should eat for your life that will feel too claustrophobic that only this i can eat your selection of food and consumption of food also must happen consciously more than what you eat how you eat it is also equally important when i say how you eat it these are all life substances every one of them had a life of their own whether it's a plant animal vegetable every one of them had a life of their own now in some way you are making food out of it you must consume it with at- utmost gratitude if you approach it with a certain sense of gratitude and reverence towards the food that you eat when i say reverence it may feel like too much for you but i'm asking you let's say we put you in a room and you had nothing to eat for 5 days if god appears in front of you what will you ask for food so that's how important it is you must understand the food on your plate is not just a substance it is not a material it is not a commodity it is life it is the life making material for you so you must treat it as such right now when it's on the plate when it's out there it has no value but the moment you consume it and it becomes your flesh and blood now suddenly it's of immense value why do we live like this it's very important when it comes on your plate itself you must treat it as a part of yourself with great reverence you must consume just the way you consume it if you change that food will behave very differently within you this is what consciousness means if people say your consciousness has no impact on your life only chemical structures have impact i'm very sorry for them because that's not how life works human consciousness has a deep and profound impact on everything that we touch especially the food that we are making another life as a part of ourselves when we're doing such an act it's very very important 
we treat it with utmost gratitude and reverence habit means you are functioning unconsciously if you are functioning unconsciously that's a bad thing because the whole thing about being human is we are capable of doing things consciously that is the beauty of being human that we can do everything consciously what an animal does unconsciously we can do the same thing consciously we can eat unconsciously or we can eat consciously we can breathe unconsciously or we can breathe consciously everything that we can do we can do it consciously the moment we do something consciously suddenly that human being looks very refined and wonderful just because somebody walks and speaks consciously doesn't he become a beautiful human being yes or no that's all so why is it that we are trying to develop habits as if there is a good thing habit means fixed realities where you don't have to think you get up in the morning and it will happen to you now don't try to automate your life that is not efficiency that is the efficiency of the machine this one is supposed to function intelligently and consciously nobody is expecting it to function like a machine so about food and stuff food must be suitable for the body that we eat for it is for the body this is a building material for this body the food that you are eating what is the appropriate food unfortunately is all messed up right now traditionally we ate very sensible in this country but this thousand years of innovations have brought other kinds of food cultures and today the national diet is pizza or pasta what is it which is one i don't know both were competing so we are losing our sense about food it's definitely time to look at what is the most suitable thing if i go into that food it's a very long process but uh, you must experiment with food not just by the tongue but by the body you eat something today and see just learn to observe how agile and how active your body feels after eating this food if it feels like it wants to go to the grave that's not good food if it feels like it wants to be alive after eating this except coffee if you eat food and your body feels very agile and alive that means it's good food body is liking it if you eat something it feels dull that means it's not liking it it's having difficulty with it that's why it feels dull so just on this basis there's a much i mean this is a very simplistic way of putting it do we must understand this food is not a religion food is not a culture food is just a fuel for this machine yes there may be cultural aspects to the tastes there may be even religious tinge to the food over a period of time but essentially food is fuel for this body so with what kind of food will it function minimal struggle within itself and maximum impact so suppose you buy a petrol car and pump diesel into it it may still roll around but not at its optimum similarly various foods you can eat and still somehow it functions but those communities which have eaten with care you can clearly see a distinct difference in the way they function the levels of intelligence and whatever so in india we prescribe food for different people in different way if you are doing menial jobs you eat one way because you need physical muscle if you are doing other kinds of trading and other kinds of activities you eat another way if you are a fighting class you eat differently and now if you are into education spiritual process and subtler aspects of life then you eat differently if you are in education one of the greatest challenges is to stay focused on something the goddamn textbook the wonderful textbook that is written is written for an average intelligence it's a common prescription it's not written for the brilliant student it is written in a way that it's a common prescription everybody gets it at that textbook how much effort it is taking for a whole lot of people how they have to read it 10 times to get it but you lie down in your bed and read a love story you remember every word yes or no how come so you don't lack memory you don't lack focus it is just that textbook and your chemistry is not uh, working 
<laughs> so what you need is a higher level of focus, a higher level of involvement. And another great enemy for a student is because this textbook is such a tranquilizer. The moment you open it, go to cinema till 2 a.m. you're up. Open the textbook at 9 o'clock. Right there, you smash into it. So sleep is another big enemy. So what kind of food do you eat so there is no inertia in the body? In yogic way of seeing things, we are looking at tamas, rajas and sattva. Tamas means inertia. Rajas means activity but no balance. Sattva means absolutely balanced kind of energy. When you're in education, you need a very balanced kind of energy because you have to focus on something which doesn't naturally interest you. It's not something that with which your chemistry is gelling. If your chemistry is gelling, you are always focused on that one, isn't it? Here, there's no chemistry, but you have to focus on that. For this, you need a balance and a steady mind. For this, you need, need to eat in a certain way. To put it very simply, food goes through your body through the alimentary canal. From your mouth, to your anal outlet, there is a pipe. Through this it runs, going through various stages of digestive process. Many of you are biology people, right? It goes through the alimentary canal. Now it begins with the, the lip. Here, if you look at this, all the herbivores and carnivores. If you look at the animal kingdom, there are herbivores and carnivores, the two main segments of animals in the world. One eats vegetable matter, another eats meat. If you look at the alimentary canal, the way it is built, between herbivores and carnivores, there's a distinct difference. Everything in the human being suggests that you are naturally a herbivore, but for the sake of survival, we became carnivores. If you look at the moment, jaw moment, all the carnivorous animals have only cutting action. Herbivores have cutting and grinding action. There are molars. But carnivores don't have widespread molars, they have just incisors, canines, and everything looks like cutting teeth. All the herbivores do grinding. What do you have? Both. So you are supposed to chew your food. Why you are supposed to chew your food is that you have enzymes in your saliva, where if you take a little bit of raw rice and put it in your mouth just for a minute, you will see it turn sweet right here, because right here, so carbohydrate is being converted into sugar right here. So if you eat properly, then we say about 30 to 50 percent of your digestion should happen in your mouth. So this part of the digestive system is expecting half digested food or partially digested food. But right now the way we're eating is mostly we are putting not only undigested food, but partially destroyed food. So, the amount of food that you need to get the same amount of energy has increased. You are eating much more food than what you should eat to generate that much of energy. Because of that, there is inertia in the body because it has to process so much more food than what it should. There is inertia. Once there is inertia, your sleep quota increases. See, this is not that you must deny yourself sleep, that's not the point. But if you eat right and do a certain things with your body, you see very effortlessly within three to four weeks you can drop your sleep quota anywhere between two to three hours. One and a half to three hours very easily you can drop if you just eat consciously and just learn to sit properly. You know, just the posture, your geometry of the body and what goes into the system. If you just manage these two things, you will see sleep quota will just come down like that. Just to tell you, for over 25 years, I have largely managed with an average of two and a half hours of sleep. Now I'm getting lazy and I'm sleeping, averaging somewhere around four and a half hours now, but seven days of the week, okay? 365 days, non-stop, on, 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 ev almost every day. My daughter didn't call me for a month. I asked, what the hell is the problem with you? Why are you not calling? She said, every six hours you're in a new city. What the hell am I supposed to do? So I said, okay, <laughs> which is true. In one day, sometimes we're doing three cities. So it's a non-stop activity. And today, many people around me have learned to do this. 
over 100 150 people around me are doing this kind of activity averaging 4 hours sleep and 7 days of the week they're on 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 all the time and uh, they are not irritated they are not frustrated they're joyful and they're wonderful why this is this there are many aspects to this but one important aspect is food how you eat not only what you eat how you eat is also very important because food is a life thing one simple thing all you girls can do is just see various health issues and inertia issue focus issue just bring 40 to 50% of the food in its raw form that means it's alive it must be a live cell it can be a vegetable it can be a fruit it can be a nut it can be sprouted gram at least 40 to 50% the food that you eat must be alive you eat dead food and you want to live this is a little difficult thing to do because you have to raise the dead now but if you eat live food one thing you will see is the state of your mind your focus and your sleep quotas and above all staying awake is not good enough you have to stay alert isn't it how alert you are how focused you are only to that extent everything yields to you in this world isn't it so what is the level of focus will determine whether the world yields to you or not isn't it and one more aspect of life one more aspect of food is when you consume something it must be of a simple uh, genetic code in the sense it must be a very simple software vegetables fruits nuts sprouts they are very simple more complicated means animal food becomes more and more complicated suppose you eat an animal which has some amount of emotion and the life of its own now the code in that we were talking about this your body is just an accumulation of memory which means a certain software isn't it this is the most complex software human software is the most complex software on the planet of all the creatures so if you eat an animal particularly a mammal if you eat it has a similar kind of complexity maybe not as complex as this similar level of complexity because it has thought and emotion of its own now for you to break that code and integrate it into your system you are not fully successful so it will leave traces of certain qualities within you you cannot break that code and make it a part of yours because it's a different and complex code if you eat a leaf a vegetable a fruit a nut or a sprout this is much simpler if you must eat non vegetarian food you must eat that which is furthest away from you so generally fish and water life is furthest away from you so if you must eat non vegetarian food the best thing to eat is uh, you have a you are on the coast <laughs> fish is the best thing to eat that way well.